You're watching New Vision TV News. I am Ruthi Nasaje. We are coming to you from the New Vision Newsroom. We start with the news around Uganda. We will look at stories making headlines across the country. Starting off the bulletin is a story from Gulu District. Now the State Minister for Health in charge of primary health care, Dr. Moriko Joyce Kaduchu, has paid an impromptu visit to Gulu Regional Referral Hospital following last week his demonstration on the appalling condition and use of its mortuary. The minister expressed shock and disappointment at the hospital administration. She camped at the facility and threatened not to leave unless cleanliness is restored. Let's take a look. Beyond last week's demonstration by Gulu residents on the appalling condition and use of the Gulu Regional Refer Hospital mortuary, the hygiene and scattered filth produces a strong stench. We need to be more vigilant. They need to watch out. We are going to talk to the management, the hospital management. They love to be vigilant. And the responsible officers should play their role. If you are in charge of mutuary, you are the attendants. Why don't you report if there are irregularities? Gloves, polythene bags, bottles, syringes, and other hospital waste have been left scattered all over the hospital compound, especially near the mortuary and mental health clinic. This is serious, eh? And, and who is the one dumping? You see, the needle is all over. Honest. There is a problem with our people who bring it The needle is all over. I can just show you one. I don't know whether she has not even freaked us. The one I got it. Look, it's a whole needle. Mm. <gasps> you people, we have a problem. Mm. We even train them, but I think I don't know what they should do. For me today, I'm told I cannot leave Gulu without clearing no. all oh. these things. Mm. Let us go to the municipal. What are we going to do? Get to the... the 4th May 2019 demonstration brought the state of the hospital to national attention. The minister warned the mortuary attendants against demanding money from people. How do you ask for money when somebody has lost a dear one? Somebody's mourning. Somebody's going to spend money in burial. Then you decide to ask for money. Oh, that is a pity. But of course, if you are caught doing that, the law will take its course. So I want to warn mortuary attendants all over the country, please get to your job and you should know that you're not supposed to ask for money you should have mercy have compassion have pity on people who lost their dear ones the government contracted a service provider green label services to handle garbage collection at the hospital however the service provider has not been collecting the rubbish for about five weeks Attempts by the minister to get an explanation from the management of green label services did not yield any results, as some employees said their contract had expired. But uh, they, told, um, they told me you've been collecting, except the yes. last five, month, five yes. weeks. Uh, we, yes. You have not collected for the last five weeks. You used to yes, collect that, weekly. Yes. You know, this, you say to people sometimes, they say, Correct from here, correct from here, correct from here. And uh, I'm glad, maybe I, when you come to Kampala, maybe I come to your office and we discuss this issue. Yeah, but now the current one, what are we going to do, the, the, the managing director? What we are going to do mm. is, um, let me consult with my operations. The hospital senior administrator, Paul Ayuk, says they have tried to do their work, but the contractors that the ministry sends are not delivering. But of course certain services are contracted. I know when you contract out the service. You can only start a process of termination. But this one, they are contracted the ministry of health. So, since so we, can, we cannot do anything on them. Since the contractor has put you on a limelight of weaknesses, mm. what are you going to do with the contractor that has been contracted to? We will inform the appointing authority of the contractor, which is the Minister of Health, that these people are not collecting the, 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 the rubbish regularly. We shall just inform. Report by Joseph Omago for New Vision TV. Honestly, injections, you see. 
<laughs> Let's move on to Kakumilo district where the Prime Minister, Dr. Hakana Rugunda, has asked landlords and tenants to respect each other's rights in the management of land. Rugunda remarked that President Jeremy Seven said no Chibanja owner should be chest of his or her land. He assured the people who are, who are resettled in Kakumio district from Mpocha that nobody would evict them from the land that was given to them by the government in the early 1990s. News from Chotira district government is working out a strategy to support churches in a bid to offer financial support to different faith best women groups. State Minister for Microfinance Haruna Chayunika Solo said on Saturday while closing a three-day Deborah Women Conference at Calvary Temple in Chotera Town Council. Now according to the minister, they chose to use churches to reach out to several disadvantaged groups which have for long appealed for financial support. He said that the strategy is aimed at empowering women to fight poverty and boost their incomes through development activities. Let's take a look at the news happening across the country. Now the National Drugs Authority has arrested five people and closed about 108 illegal drug ships and clinics in the western region recently. Now this was during the five-day joint operation concluded by NDA and police last week. About 181 drug outlets were inspected in Liantonde, Kiruhura, Mbarara, Insinjiro, Bushenyi, Shemarakai, Ivanda, Kamwenge, Kabale, Intungamo, Rubanda, Kasese, Rubirizi, Mitoma, Chotera, and Buhwejo districts. News from Kagadi District, the Bishop of Hoimad Catholic Diocese, Vincent Chilavo, has cautioned Kagadi Christians against superstition, witchcraft, and drunkardness, which is said has escalated poverty and social conflicts in the community. He stated that acts of witchcraft, cannibalism, and excessive drinking of alcohol are ungodly and are responsible for the escalating poverty, family conflicts, and illiteracy in society. Chirabo wondered how a witch doctor who lives in a grass thatched house and lacks best needs can give inward wealth or blessings of prosperity. Let's move north. In Amuru district, the vice president Edward Chuan Kasekand has called on Ugandans to offer voluntary services in hospitals. Sekandi was launching a hospital block at Atiak Health Center for in Amuru district. He also inspected an international hospital which is being constructed at the border district to provide services to Ugandans in South Sudan, especially ac accident victims and the elderly people. The vice president was informed by his host, Rod Richard Santo Apiri, chief of ATIAC, that the hospital is understaffed and needs upgrading. Because Amuru doesn't have a referral hospital, and they normally need to go to Bulu or Lacho. So our prayer is that uh, you pass your wise message to His Excellency to consider upgrading the hospital to a referral Level. However, the vice president threw the grantlet on the youth to provide the much needed services at no cost. All the youth of Amuru district and other parts of Uganda to develop in themselves a spirit of some services free. I agree with Dr. David Arobo's Zabu group motto. That doing good is good business. The vice president's visa was also honored with a healthy camp to treat non-communicable diseases and other ailments. The camp was organized by Sabo Foundation.
According to the host and the Atia Traditional Chief of Teresa Ayiko International Hospital, located about 25 kilometers from the South Sudan border in Atia Sub County, it will provide services to Ugandans working in the volatile South Sudan, especially accident victims, and also help elder people in the district. And these are medical problems that range from eye problems, uh, cancer. Uh, gynecological problems, you name it, it is all here. Added to that, you have seen the age, age problem also. There are a lot of old people in this area who really need a serious medical attention. But of course, this step that we have taken will definitely go a long way to help the, uh, the medical, the, the health sector. The road also thanked the government for returning peace in northern Uganda, which had been turned into a large IDP camp during the LRA insurgency. We are committed as government to see that health services increase in outreach and in quality. It is the health population that works to make a country develop. Although we belong to different political parties, faith and pride, we should have common ground when it comes to issues of common good for our people. This report was compiled by Omagol Joseph for New Vision TV. <laughs>
The host and celebrant, Catherine Lamuaka, asked the president to construct for the people of Omoro more hospitals equipped with ambulances for their endless support during elections. Your Excellency, in a special way, we take the opportunity to warmly welcome you to Omoro district. As we do a lot, we so the aspect of health. But despite all joy, the deputy speaker, Jacobo Olanya, warned the president that some of the decisions government is making are causing negative murmurs among their Choli people. Where yeah, you found people like mine and organize how to liberate this country from dictatorship. We made our contribution. That historical connection must never be broken. I am happy you are here. This part of the country is in a fairly somber mood. It is a somber mood. There is some murmur and discussions that are not good going on at the moment. I'm not going to go into any detail, but when I meet you, I'll tell you. Some decisions that have been taken by the government most recent have caused some resentment in the Tony region. When I discuss with you, Your Excellency, I'll be suggesting to you how we can do it better. He added that some government programs have good intentions, but the implementation is so poor. The problem is, sometimes we have good things to do. And we must do them. But we do them so badly that they start looking back themselves. And yet they are good things. Your Excellency, I'll discuss this with you in detail and take your advice on how we can bring this and ease in a Tony Sub region down. It is not good, Your Excellency. It is not. With the issues like the ongoing upper land crisis on the agenda, the President confirmed that he will return to the region soon. He said on May 22nd he will be in Padel meeting political leaders and technocrats. On the 23rd of May, he will be in Gulu to launch the USMID roads. This report was compiled by Joseph Omogol for New Vision TV. Okay. Uh That is it for the news around Uganda. Let us take a look at the news around East Africa and around the world with Lynn Komjishev. Hello, you're watching New Vision TV. This is News Around East Africa. My name is Lynn Komjishev. We start off with Kenya. At least 10 people have died and more than a dozen others injured after a Wajil bound bus collided with a trailer on the Garissa Mwingi Road. The accident occurred a few minutes to midnight Sunday and 10 people died on the spot. Two more succumbed to their injuries on the way to hospital. The crash at Tula area between Bangal and Garissa town involved a Nasib Circle bus that had left the capital Nairobi Sunday evening. Reports indicate the bus with 50 passengers on board rammed into a trailer that had stalled on the road. The trailer transporting cement tore into the bus and ripped away windows and a section of the roof, injuring many. In Tanzania, a Tanzanian opposition activist has been found beaten and unconscious at a village in the country's southern highlands five days after an identified people abducted him, stoking new fears of an opposition crackdown. Mudude Njagali, a young activist with the main opposition Chadema party, was found late Wednesday at a village near his hometown of Mbea, his party announced. Opposition groups say several campaigners have been attacked over the past three years after they criticized President John Magufuli's government, accused by critics of authoritarian rule since he came into power in late 2015. In Uganda, Border Border 2010, Petron Haji Abdallah Chitata has been found guilty of unlawful possession of firearms by the General Court Marshal. The case was presided over by a seven member panel led by Lieutenant General Andrew Guti. Chitata and nine others were battling charges of unlawful possession of firearms, ammunition, and military gear. 
In South Sudan, South Sudan's capital Juba will ban all clubs and limit bar hours due to alleged immoral acts taking place in night sports, according to the presidency. Jubek state government has banned all nightclubs, bars and night music shows. A statement issued by the presidency said the governor, Jubek state, Agustino Jadala Wani, said in a video posted on Facebook that while nightclubs would be shut, bars would have their hours limited to early evening and would be forbidden from operating during the day. Away from East Africa, we'll take a look at what's making headlines elsewhere in Africa. We'll start off with Sudan. Sudan's army rulers and protesters are to hold fresh talks over handing power to a civilian administration Monday. Spokesman for the Generals and the Prospect Movement said on Saturday, the Alliance for Freedom and Change, an umbrella for the protest movement, said the Generals had invited it for a new round of talks after several days of deadlock. No explanation has been given on why the talks were postponed, but sources in the Alliance said that more time was needed for council consultations within the leadership. The talks are being held in an optimistic atmosphere and that the negotiations are aimed at reaching an agreement over the arrangements of the transitional period. In Burkina Faso, gunmen killed six people attending mass at the Catholic Church of Dablo in northern Burkina Faso Sunday morning. Officials and witnesses said the priest and five churchgoers were among the victims. The attackers were about 40 on motorcycles, made everyone lie down and executed five before torching the church, according to a witness. The attackers set parts of the church and nearby shops on fire before fleeing the scene roughly an hour and a half after they arrived. Multiple injuries have been reported. Last week, a gunman killed five people in a Protestant church in the small northern town of Siligaji. In the UK, British Prime Minister Theresa May's Conservatives have fallen to fifth place in an opinion poll ahead of the May 23rd European parliamentary election as pressure grows for her to set a date for her own departure. Nigel Farage's Brexit party was in the lead at four percentage points and 34 percent, while May's Conservative Party had just 10 percent. The opposition Labour Party was down five points on 16 percent. Two parties which support staying in the EU, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, were on 15 percent and 11 percent respectively. The collapse in support for the Conservative Party is piling pressure on May to set a date for her departure. Senior Conservatives want May to set out her plans this week. News coming in from Iran. Iran said Monday it had sentenced an Iranian woman to 10 years in prison for spying for Britain as tension rises between Tehran and some Western countries over its nuclear and missile programs. Ismaili said the woman was in charge of projects for cultural infiltration in Iran. He did not identify her but said she was a student in Britain before being recruited by the British Council. The woman has been in custody for almost a year and it's not known if she holds a British nationality. The British Foreign Office did not immediately respond to an email requesting comment. The British Council's Britain's cultural agencies overseas. The arrest of Iranians accused of espionage has increased since Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said last year there had been infiltration of Western agents in the country. Iran has been increasingly at odds with Western countries since the United States withdrew from a deal. Tehran side with global powers to curb its nuclear program in return for the lifting of sanctions. News coming in from Sweden. Julian Assange is to be investigated in Sweden in a rape case dating from August 2010. The Wikileaks founder currently in Belmash prison in London now faces likely extradition from Britain. An arrest warrant was issued and Julian Assange was declared an internationally wanted suspect in November 2010 after Assange skipped bail in the UK and went into hiding at the Ecuadorian embassy in London. The extradition order was impossible to enforce. In November 2016, Assange was interviewed by Ecuadorian prosecutors after an agreement was reached between Sweden and Ecuador to cooperate in criminal investigations. 
Now, news coming in from China. China will never surrender to external pressure. The government said Monday, though, stopped short of announcing how Beijing will hit back after Washington renewed its threat to impose tariffs on all Chinese imports in an escalating trade dispute. The trade war between the world's top two economies jumped up a year Friday, with the United States hiking tariffs on 200 billion U.S. dollars worth of Chinese goods after President Donald Trump said Beijing broke the deal by reneging on an earlier commitment made during months of negotiations. Trump also ordered U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer to begin imposing tariffs on all remaining imports from China, a move that would affect about an additional 300 billion U.S. dollars worth of goods. Beijing has vowed to respond to the latest U.S. tariffs but has announced no details yet. And that was news around East Africa and around the world. My name is Lynn Komjisha. I leave you with Ruth Nasaja taking a look at what's making headlines in today's New Vision. Thank you, Lynn. I'll just take a look at what is going to happen in the Tuesday paper pullouts, we shall have her vision, we shall also have oil and gas, and also the daily holiday companion. Now her vision says, Sunday was Mother's Day. It is a special day to, put tri to pay tribute to mothers. Nora Mutesi explores the common belief that boys or men have stronger bonds with their mothers than their fathers. We have more details and more stories in have vision, grab your copy and get those details. Now, moving on to the oil and gas, you know, expect why Uganda is going to earn 188 trillion shillings in oil and much more stories you should get to know happening in the oil and gas sector. Now, those having holidays, the Holiday Companion is right there. The reading series continues and we shall have Stranger Ghost Missing. Also, find recipes and puzzles and much more. You need to know or read while in your holidays. Now, out of the pullouts that come out every Tuesday, let us take a look at the news in the sports world. St. Lawrence extended their lead in the National Beach Soccer table standings. The inverse side humble drivers Buganda 5-3 and MS Sand 9 for in the local league played over the weekend at Mutola Resort Beach in Intenjeru, Mukono District. The victory saw them move to 36 points, three above second place. Buganda. Sly Manuchero, who is the top scorer of St. Lawrence with 27 goals plus Swale Chigundu and Jonathan Chikonyogu are some of the scorers for the investor side in both sides as they seek to maintain their chances of winning the league alive. Elsewhere, Primo Kimera notched a hat-trick before Hassan Luboyera, Peter Waswa and Agustin Waswa each had a brace and own goal from Derek Sekulima as Buganda thrashed talented 10-2. Michael Chisembo, an own goal from Lule Paul were the consolations for talented who risk to be relegated. Isabeth beat KIU 8-3 in the final to walk away with the men's title last season when Mutesa won Rain Vastu were declared the champions in the women league after topping the table with 30 points. Moving on, Tito Kelo was instrumental as Acholi Provis opened up a five gap in the FUFA drum competition. Okelo, who was named man of the match, was on score as Acholi defeated West Nile 2 0 away at Greenlight Stadium in Arua to move to nine points in Group C, five above second placed Bunyoro. The Viper striker, who took his tally to three goals in the three games, also walked out with an accolade and cash prize of 100,000 shillings. Hudu Mulichu scored the other goal for Acholi, who have not lost any game in the second edition. In other games played in Group C, second played Bunyoro four points settled to 1-1 one -one draw with bottom side Karamoja one point in Hoima. West Nile a third with three points. The competition that is played between 16 provinces of Uganda is aimed at taking the game to the masses and its team is celebrating the Anstree. 
Buganda province went down in the books of history as the maiden winners of the FUFA drum tournament. They edged West Nile 2 1 on aggregate in two legged final to win the inaugural edition of the Inter Province Championship. Government and FIFA are part of the sponsors of the competition. Some international sport, Pep Guardiola has expressed his gratitude towards Liverpool for pushing Manchester City as champions retained the Premier League title on the last day of the season. Now City came from goal down to defeat Brighton 4-1, ending the season on 98 points to become the first side to retain the Premier League crown since 2009. Liverpool's attempt to win the league after 29 years of waiting fell short after they finished a point behind City and Guardiola thanked the Reds for the tough challenge they gave them. This was the eighth time the Premier League title has been decided on the final day of the season, with Manchester City winning it on three of those occasions, which were in 2011, 2012, 2013 to 14, and 2018 to 2019. Away from sports news, in our Daily Pal of Africa series, we look at flamingos. Now, these are located at Lake Munyanyange, which is located in the northeast part of Katwe, Kabatoro Town Council. The abundance of these flamingos is attributed to the constant migration from far places as Kenya and also Canada. Let's take a look. When you wade, the waters of Lake Munyanyange, tall, graceful, and brightly colored pinkish orange birds catch your eye. They are the most instantly recognized wading birds in the world, the flamingo birds. In the midst of other birds such as white, brown, African hoppers, winding desert crystal colors among so many others flamingos are the most recognizable wedding birds in the world and special to the hearts of birders and non-birders the flamingo birds migrate from as far places as kenya and even canada these end up settling at lake munyanyange Flamingo stems from a word flamingo, a Spanish and Latin word which means fire and refers to the bright color of the bird's feathers. The pink, orange or red color of a flamingo's feathers is caused by pigments in their food. A wild flamingo's diet includes shrimp, plankton, and algae from the water sources. If those food sources do not provide enough pigmentation, flamingos may seem more gray or white, but they are still healthy and strong. Flamingos' oddly shaped beaks are specifically adapted to separate mud and sleet from the food they consume. Flamingos have a wild lifespan of 20 to 30 years. Many flamingos are threatened by predators and poachers. An adult flamingo is 3.3 to 4.6 feet tall and weighs between 3.3 to 9 pounds. Lake Munyanyange has now become a tourist area for bird watching to many tourists who come to Uganda. Now for more of Africa stories, visit our website, which is newvision.ca.ug forward slash Pearl of Africa. Our newspaper, The Sun Division, is also another home of adventures. Grab your copy every Sunday for Pearl of Africa stories. We now speak business in the handshake with Lynn Komdishe. Well, hello. My name is Lynn Komdishe. You have heard that the sugar bill is up 
<laughs> and making a lot of noise and is causing controversy around uh, the country and those involved in the sugar industry. Well, I have with me Edna uh, trying to understand a lot of things. Edna, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lee. Why is this bill ca causing a lot of controversy <laughs> even before it is passed? Mm. Parliament actually passed it, but the yes. president sent yes, it yes, back yes. to them because there's a particular clause. This clause says that uh, there should be a distance of 50 kilometers mm -hmm. between sugar factories. Right. Players who have been there a long time meant a lot to them and it has them to grow because fifth, one on one player in fifth, chances are high there's no one poaching on my cane because they are so far away. Oh yes. Yes, but then now we have uh, smaller players that have come into the industry. Mm -hmm and many of them are concentrated mm -hmm. much closer than the 50 kilometers. It's the risk of cane poach. Mm -hmm. And you know how, how these guys, the bigger players are actually in the outgrowers yes. plantations, but they also as because they need to manage quality, ensure high yields. So they actually just give them... Um, so if I have invested in and another factory open mm. that does not have enough cane it's yes. itself and stuff on the cane that I have invested a problem. <laughs> so so why did they come up with this idea of zoning? Zoning was uh, done many years ago. It was in the it's one of the things that they are trying to overturn. Ah. The initial the zoning had been there. Yes. You see it, fifty kilometers yes. apart. That was standard. Was okay. Yes, but so then where now, is the problem now? The problem is that they want to remove that 50 kilometer uh -huh. radius. Yes, and when they remove it, it means I can set up my plant uh, 20 kilometers away from you, mm -hmm. but we are getting from the same resources. Uh -huh. If I haven't planned and grown my cane, which when you talk to the sugar people, it's quite interesting mm. that they have to develop the seed cane. It is money they put together as the Sugar Growers Association. Yeah, yeah. They put it together and put it in science to develop seed cane. Wow. So if a smaller player comes, hasn't invested in seed I cane, know. the risk of poaching is high, high, especially because the distance between us is, is it's easy to poach on my outgrowers and, uh, you know. So, wow. Mm. So what are they going to do about it? Well, what the, should they do about it? The president has sent it back. Yep. The sugar industry grew when they are, when like zoning helped to okay. you see. So, mm -hmm. I they should leave it like well. So, yeah. so why had they brought it up? Why did they? Well, they claim to uh, want it to regulate the industry, but then the bill. Yes, yes, the industry. Yes. It's only one clause that is causing problems. So it came up recently for, for just that they clause? Sent it, it's that, that they want to overturn the zoning clause yes. and remove it. <laughs> and that is going to be a problem if, if, uh, if it, because it will encourage all those vices from the people that are not sure, doing best not practice. Doing, yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm. Well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> well, I'm wondering, mm. uh, because if, if it is going to cause a lot of chaos, mm. who then is interested in removing it? <laughs> the people that are not <laughs> developing their cane. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Why I ask this is mm. because what then? What are they looking out for? What has not worked enough? And mm. uh, uh, what do they seek to achieve? By removing eventually the, by removing the zoning clause, mm. you'll be able to put up your sugar factory anywhere. Yes, and if if you're not regulating that that space, mm. there is a problem. You know, you don't want these people too close to each other. Mm -hmm. Of course, some people say it will encourage competition, but it helps companies to grow. To grow, know? yes. Yeah. So individually, yes. So. It's something to think about. I mean, the president has sent it back. Now we watch what, what will parliament do. <laughs> I, I wonder. Yeah. But oh well, that's the bill for you, the sugar bill for you there. I, I don't know much about sugar. I don't even take sugar. But the thing is, I think it's a very interesting thing to yeah. look out for. Yes. Are there chances of, uh, of them you know, coming down and removing this clause? The president has said no. 
he has sent back he this. Wants it. He wants He has sent the sugar <laughs> bill back. So I think what we do now is watch the, the discussion yes. and see the those who are for it, those mm -hmm. who are not for zoning, and watch the economic arguments. And yeah. Then, yeah. Would, would this have guiding. any effects on the economy at all? Um, well, if there is poaching, cane poaching, it's bad for the it's industry. So bad for yes. The industry, yes, it's bad for the industry. If it's bad for the industry, the ripple effects. Absolutely. Yeah. So we we'll wait and see. Okay. There are arguments for both, but yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Edna. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. In our special report today. It is three years since President Yuri Museveni swore in as president of Uganda after the 2016 general elections. As the clock ticks to 2021 general elections, let us take a look at the achievements in the previous years. On May 12, 2019, President Yoram Museveni completed three years of his five-year mandate in office that began in 2016. After winning the election, he took oath of office on May 12 for his fifth term that expires in 2021. Uganda has been holding regular elections every five years since 1996, which partly has put the country on a democratic path and made it different from the past when people had no say in who governed them. Last week, the Prime Minister, Dr. Ruhakana Rugunda, revealed that 62% of pledges President Museveni made in the National Resistance Movement Manifesto in 2016 had been fulfilled. Some of these include industrialization. <laughs> President Museveni has lately been launching factories that produce goods ranging from food products to agriculture inputs and other essential commodities. Rugunda cited the commissioning of 183 megawatts Isimba Dam, the revival of the Uganda Airlines, the opening of the Entebbe Expressway and the Nile Bridge as major achievements. The completion of his third year comes at a time when some opposition politicians want President Museveni out of power. Their litany of grievances includes economic failure, rule of law and freedoms. It's for those reasons that they want him out of office. On the face of it, this by Western standards would go as politics where a case false or true is built against a politician to persuade voters to reject him or her using elections. But in the case of Uganda, it is different. They want the president out by means other than elections. It is a fact there are Ugandans who support President Museveni and those who don't. It is also a fact that the one who has majority support is president. <laughs> this can only be proved through an election. In 2016, out of the 9,851,812 valid votes, President Museveni garnered 5,971,872, of which met 60.62%, beating six opponents who together collected 3,879,940 votes, resulting in Museveni being declared winner. In 2021, there will be another test. Whoever has majority support will emerge through the election as president. A pattern of regular elections as a means of electing the president and other leaders at different levels has been formed since 1996. It is not only a pattern, but also empowerment of the people to decide who leads them. Since independence in 1962, Uganda never had elections until 1980. Uganda People's Congress, in alliance with Kabaka Yeka, a party for the Baganda, took the reins of the then young nation, but derailed. That is it we had for you. Thank you for watching. Be sure to catch more news updates and other programs here on New Vision TV by visiting our website, which is newvision.co.eug forward slash video. You can follow us on social media. Facebook is the New Vision. 
Twitter is at New Vision Wire, Instagram is at New Vision Wire, and our YouTube channel is New Vision TV. Catch up with me on my Twitter handle, I am Ruth, the voice. We end with a fact file. <music>